Good evening. Welcome to the Pocatello League presentation, State and National Trends in Criminal Justice. The League of Women Voters of the U.S. adopted a position on sentencing policy in 2012. League believes alternatives to imprisonment should be explored and utilized taking into consideration the circumstances and nature of the crime. League also opposes mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses. Emerging research is changing what is known about and what works in criminal justice to reduce recidivism and to enhance public safety. Tonight, Carrie Hong will speak about the intersection of criminal justice and behavioral health and also discuss pre-trial justice reforms nationally and in Idaho. Carrie currently serves as a trial court administrator for the 6th district, uh, 6th judicial district of Idaho. And prior to this position, he worked for the administrative offices of the Idaho Supreme Court as the Director of Justice Services Division and as a statewide misdemeanor sentencing specialist. Carrie has experience as a problem-solving court coordinator, family court services coordinator, and court assistance officer. Please help me welcome Carrie Hahn. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, it's really exciting for me to, to be in and have a chance to talk uh, to this group about things I'm, I'm passionate about. When I talk about my passion, it, it's not just professional. Um, I've worked for the courts for nearly 17 years now, um, but uh, and, and it's one of those situations where the, the work that I get paid for is also the work that makes my, my heart good, for the most part. When I, when I try and talk to folks about what my days are like, I usually tell them it's more smiles than tears. We have uh, our own set of frustrations and challenges and opportunities to improve, but really now is an exciting time to work for the courts, and an exciting time to look at uh, what we know about uh, the criminal justice system, about behavioral health, about what works and what, what research and data points us to invest limited public resources to improve outcomes for public safety and for offender rehabilitation. We, we really feel in the last decade that I've worked for the courts that we're on the cusp of, of some tremendous opportunities for improving how we do business uh, for our communities, for our offenders, um, and, and for the over, overall operation of, of, a, of a good moral society. Uh, a couple things from, from the outset here. First, uh, I am the court administrator for the 6th Judicial District. I'm a state employee. My boss is the administrative district judge. Um, so uh, right now, the administrative district judge in the, in the 6th District is Mitch Brown, whose chambers are down in Caribou County. And then also the administrative director of the court, Sarah Thomas. Um, I'm here to speak tonight not on behalf of the Supreme Court. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is really about um, some research and some uh, some ideas and some activities that are happening both in our, in, in, in our state and also nationally. Um, but I don't speak for the court. Um, also, I'd like to make a note that the court, as a, as, as a, uh, a general principle, doesn't take policy positions. Um, the court res, you know, really respects the legislature's province in, in setting policy, really respects the will of the voters uh, in terms of, of, of expressing through elections the direction of, of the state. And the court, while always retaining the, you know, the ability to exercise judicial review, um, takes a step back from, the, from those policy uh, setting things. Uh, when the court does have needs or does have uh, 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 issues to bring forth to the legislature, typically it's to request for the, res the resources and the, and the, and the proper, uh, uh, the, the proper uh, uh, judgeships or funding to accomplish the mission and the policy that the, that the legislature and the people of the state of Idaho have set forth with the courts. So those are kind of my disclaimers. Uh, my background is not of, of science or of treatment. Uh, I went to law school. I've never practiced as an attorney. I have an undergrad degree in political science. 
Most of my experience is practical and then participating in, in a lot of trainings and implementation and, and really seeing firsthand of what we're doing in Idaho and being able to go to different states and see what they're trying and what works and what doesn't work in terms of, of, of court activities um, and particularly what we talk about tonight on the criminal side. So let me talk real briefly about maybe some big numbers to paint you a picture. Um, I want to begin by saying that right now we, we live in good times in terms of if we look at uh, crime in America. Uh, in terms of crime in America, uh, our crime rates are now, and this is per kind of 100,000 population, are about where they were in the early 1960s. And so if we look at crime rates, there was a, a, a growth and a trend towards the end of the 60s, going up through the 70s, spiking in the 90s, and then we've seen a, a really a tremendous and, and almost unprecedented decline in the crime rate. Recently, we've seen some spikes, particularly around some, some violent crimes, and uh, if we look at uh, some, you know, we, particularly in some larger cities and some metro areas, the increase in violent crimes there. But, but really, and relatively, relatively, we live in, in, in safe times. Um, if we look at the state of Idaho, and we look in the 6th Judicial District in particular, when we talk about the 6th Judicial District, these are the six counties in southeast Idaho. So this is, this is Bear Lake, Bannock, Power County, Caribou County, Oneida, and Franklin County, our 6th Judicial District. In the state of Idaho, criminal filings have declined over the last 10 years. Um, if we look at uh, the difference between filings at a magistrate judge level, so misdemeanor offenses, and we look at filings at the district court level, so felony offenses, there's some separation there. Um, misdemeanor filings account for a much higher percentage of the work of the court than do uh, felony offenses. In the sixth judicial district, um, we follow generally what the state is doing. There's some minor exceptions, but let me, let me share this. Misdemeanor filings have gone down dramatically in the last 10 years, uh, over 20%. On the other hand, beginning around 2013, 2014, we've seen an increase in, in district court filings, district court criminal filings and felony filings. If we look back in our judicial district over 10 years, uh, ending in 2017, uh, we've had a 39% increase in felony filings. And that's a fairly dramatic percentage Remember, you know, keeping in mind that in, in a given year, you might only have about 800 or 900 uh, felony filings. But, but that's an important thing to, to look at. Overall, criminal filings down, but specifically in district court and felony filings, we are seeing an increase. And it's tough to really attribute that increase to any one thing in particular. When we, when we take a look at, at uh, filings by statute, you'll see increases in a lot of different areas. And in talking to prosecutors and public defenders and judges, you know, you can, they, they'll, they'll point their fingers in different areas, whether it's about the, the substance use problems, the uh, uh, possession of controlled, controlled substances filings, whether related to the opioid epidemic or methamphetamines, you know, heroin being part of the opioid uh, epidemic, or changes in, in statute, those have effects. We saw the look back period for felony DUIs being extended from 10 to 15 years. So some changes in statute that increases the, 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 the filings uh, in the district court. So we do see some trend numbers. And remember, these are filings. These aren't dispositions where people have been found um, guilty or, or innocent. This is just that a criminal complaint was filed with the court and resulted in either a misdemeanor filing or a felony filing. So generally, again, safer relatively times, but we do have some concerning trends. Uh, and we're, we're doing our best to take a look at those, both to make sure the courts have enough resources but also to help us understand the important role the courts have in, in looking at outcomes. Uh, a lot of times uh, when we think about the courts, it's, we have this, this idea that there's this uh, uh, proceeding, the trial, where we, get a, we go all the way through presenting of evidence and the court hearing motions, you know, there's a, whether there's a jury or a court trial, ultimately a disposition and a sentencing and a, and a judgment's passed. And that person goes on to whatever that is. What we found uh, and, and what we've kind of seen along with problem-solving courts and other ways that uh, we're, we're trying to employ some, some research-based or evidence-based practices, that the judge's role in that case doesn't end. It never really ended at sentencing. If someone was placed on probation, if someone was struggling or failing, they would come back on a probation violation or a review hearing, and the judge would, would, would listen to what's going on with that case, where the offender was struggling or where the offender was doing good, um, either revoke probation or impose new conditions, 
they might go on to retain jurisdiction or a rider program into the custody of the department of correction to get some additional treatment and then come back to the community a lot of different options but the point i'm trying to make is the judge's role in that case doesn't end the sentencing and it never and it never has but more now more than ever we're seeing the judges really understanding how through evidence-based sentencing through problem solving courts alternative uh, uh alternative sentences to incarceration there's a real opportunity to be forward thinking both on a public safety standpoint on an accountability standpoint and also on a rehabilitation standpoint for improving how the public's investment both in terms of concern of what happens to your community and in terms of the public investment in terms of tax funds that you put into the system uh, to try and get good outcomes for the community as a well. whole. I'd like to talk about kind of two areas very specifically today. Um, and I hope this can be conversational. Uh, I, I asked the folks to give me a microphone because I didn't want this, this bench to be between myself and, and, and you folks because um, I, I really like questions. I like to have conversations. Um, I have a lot of random information and facts that are packed up in my head and I can talk about those for a long time. But I, I'd like to present some ideas and then really engage you. Uh, I'm not afraid to say I don't know or I can follow up or I'll let me look up and, and get back to you. I know I don't know uh, everything and I'm sure you guys will have many questions that will make me scratch my head as well. But I, I'd like to share with you some things that, that excite me and then we'll kind of go into a, a more of a conversation. So, so two areas uh, and Pam, Pam nailed them in the introduction. Something that, that I spent nearly my entire career in the courts focused on is the intersection of criminal justice and behavioral health. And what I'd like to talk to you about tonight first before I talk about pretrial justice and pretrial reform in Idaho um, is some really challenging ideas that, that when I first heard about the research and, and actually saw it in practice, kind of turned what I thought about mental illness in particular and, and criminality on its head because it's, it's counterintuitive. And so I'll, maybe I'll begin with a, a thought exercise. You know, and the thought exercise is when we think of, of someone who has a mental illness, who's been charged with a crime, my, my initial presumption is, is that, wow, this person had these untreated, has an untreated mental illness. They became symptomatic, decompensated, and because of the, the exercise of these symptoms, they found themselves engaged in circumstances or with people or, or committing acts that led them directly to the criminal justice system. And I think that's an implicit assumption that many of us have. But the thought exercise is, well, what if that was totally wrong? And, and, and really, that thought exercise has been turned into peer-reviewed empirical research that tells us for the vast majority, about 90% of the people with serious mental illness who are also in the criminal justice system, there's very little correlation between being symptomatic, meaning that they're because of their serious mental illness. When I talk about serious mental illness, I'm talking about depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia. That when, I'm, when that person is symptomatic, uh, that doesn't necessarily correlate to when they committed the criminal activity or the acts that got them in the criminal justice system. The other part of that is, is that when that person who has that serious mental illness receives the gold standard of treatment, and for, for our discussion, let's say the gold standard of treatment is assertive community treatment, which is a, an evidence-based model where there's a specific team of clinicians who work with that person to make sure they have medication, they have social supports, they've looked at the major areas of life functioning and, and they're doing their best to support that person, to address all that. So if that, if that person has the gold standard of, of community mental health services and they reduce symptoms, and they reduce hospitalizations, does that equate into reduced recidivism? The research says, for the vast majority, it doesn't. Which, which really, really throws things topsy-turvy. That um, a, a lot of a lot of what uh, a lot of what, uh, what what you come in thinking, and a lot of what when I talk to probation officers or problem-solving court coordinators or, or judges. A lot of it is is like that. That makes that makes no sense. What we need is treatment in the community, and if we provide this treatment, then people will become stable, and when they become stable, they'll reduce recidivism. What we know about recidivism now, and what the research is telling us, is is that mental illness is very loosely, if, if at all, co uh, connected with criminality. Right. 
when we talk about criminogenic need, and what criminogenic is is just a fancy word for saying factors in someone's life that are, that are tied to committing crimes. There's, there's about eight factors. The big four are really the ones that are, are, are most highly correlated with criminal behavior, and that's having antisocial peers, antisocial beliefs, lack of pro-social activities, um, you know, uh, 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 poor attitude towards supervision. Um, those things are really predictive, and mental health really isn't even on the board. Actually, more often than not, having a mental illness is a protective factor that you're less likely uh, to have uh, to, to commit a crime if you are mentally ill than if you than, than if uh, uh, if you don't have that mental illness. So when we think about this, and if we go over to the Bannock County Jail and ask Sheriff Nelson to look at uh, look at the inmates, what we see there is so Carrie, you told me all this, but if we open the doors, we're going to see in the Bannock County Jail, uh, you know, about 14% of males and about. 30% of, of females are going to have a mental illness, which is dramatically higher than, than what we have in the non-criminal justice population. I think we're down in the 3%, 3 to 5%, just across the board for the general population. So you're saying, Carrie, if, if mental illness is loosely, if at all, correlated with criminality, why do we have so many mentally ill people in the criminal justice system? And more importantly, what, what can we do about it? Um, the reason is, and then the reason what, 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 research, what, what research tells us is, is that mental illness doesn't cause crime, but mentally ill people have more criminogenic factors in their life than people who aren't mentally ill. And if we want to make an improvement in terms from a public safety perspective and from a public health perspective, we need to provide treatment. We, we, uh, decreasing symptoms, decreasing hospitalizations is a worthy important goal. But if we do that, it doesn't necessarily change recidivism. Um, what we have to do is, is also address those criminogenic factors. And there's some things, some really exciting things like the mental health court, like uh, specialized caseloads for probation, taking special strategies that use less sanction threats, so threats that if you don't comply, I'm going to put you in jail or, or have you punished, and, uh, engaging people with uh, firm, fair, uh, supportive probation officers who have maybe a higher tolerance uh, for technical violations of condition of probation. Um, and then also adopting uh, what is generally called a problem solving approach. And in that problem solving court, uh, approach, using that time to engage that person in understanding that, you know, that there's been assessments done. Based upon these assessments, we understand what your main criminogenic risk factors. And by addressing those criminogenic risk factors, we're going to help you reduce the likelihood that you're going to commit another crime. The way mental illness kind of ties into all this, there's, there's, this, there's a, a dominant theory in criminal rehabilitation right now. It's called risk needs responsibility. Risk is not risk to be violent. It's not risk to hurt someone. What risk means is it's a percentage that indicates that we've examined people who are in the penitentiary who have similar factors like you, and based upon people who have those similar, similar factors, they commit crimes at this rate. Okay? So risk is risk to recidivate, not risk to hurt someone. So what we do is we do a, a validated assessment, and this is kind of where big data comes into play. A validated assessment just means that they've, they've done, the, they've done the, the research that based upon the population we're trying to assess, that there's an indication that the tool I'm using to assess you is predictive and valid. So we do a risk assessment. We look at those, based upon that risk assessment, we focus our energies on people who are moderate or high. Really, if we want to get the biggest return on our money, we're focusing people who are at high risk to recidivate because there's, there's the biggest opportunity to change the likelihood of, of them reoffending right there. Um, we focus our efforts on people who are high, uh, moderate to high risk. Um, we look at their needs. And what needs are are services or interventions that we can deliver that are uh, specifically tied to why they commit crimes, and by addressing those, by, by providing them with what they need, we'll be able to reduce those factors. And then look at responsivity. What responsivity means generally is looking at the right intervention at the right time for the right person. If you have someone who's had a lot of trauma, the responsivity uh, uh, effect would be is to provide them with interventions that, that understand or are really designed to assist someone who has experienced trauma in their life. Um, it's, it could be gender specific, making sure that we have an opportunity for, for women to get women specific treatment, for men to get men specific treatment. 
And also when we're talking about mental illness, mental illness is no criminogenic factor, but it is a responsivity factor. And when, when we look at this, it, it's one of those things that the way I presented it, um, it, it, it is wordy and filled with a little bit of jargon, but to break it all the way down, if someone is, is actively symptomatic with a mental illness, they're not gonna benefit uh, going into group. They're not gonna benefit by being placed in a scenario where because of their, because of their symptoms, they aren't able to uh, be receptive of the information that's being presented to them. They're not gonna be able to engage in treatment. And so unless they're stabilized, we really can't address all the other criminogenic factors that are in their life. So uh, if we wanna get a good outcome, we have to stabilize the mental illness, but also recognize that mental illness isn't the ultimate master key status of why that person's in the criminal justice system. Um, that often, uh, when I'm talking, well, I'll tell you, uh, when I'm talking to a room of probation, this is usually a very hopeful conversation because what it really comes down to is uh, clinicians are great at reducing symptoms and decreasing hospitalizations, but probation officers are really an amazing resource that is probably, um, in terms of uh, intervention in the community for offenders who have a mental illness, probably one of the brightest stars for in improving outcomes for people with mental illness who are under correctional supervision. And the reason why is, is relationship. Um, what the research has told us is if you have a probation officer who <coughs> is not taking an authoritarian position, but is really taking a position that they're here to assist the person in being successful on probation, rather than catching you messing up on probation, these people are gonna finish probation at a higher rate. These folks are going to be able to be better connected with services that will help them stabilize in the community. And in terms of the, the treatment effect of having that uh, relationship with that probation officer, we see this carrying on uh, for a, the, the tail leg, the treatment effect of that carries on uh, uh, years down the line, which is, which is such a, a great thing to be able to tell probation officers how empowering and how important they are and how that relationship that they have with that offender is really based upon the research. And I've seen it in practice. The thing that really can make a difference between someone being successful in the community, um, not committing a new crime, successfully completing probation versus going to prison. Um, so when we think about our limited public resources and where to invest money, I'm, I'm, I'm never one to say we don't need treatment. And I think some of you might have been in, in different meetings with me uh, or, or different presentations where well, you'll hear me be the biggest advocate for treatment because it's, it's hugely important for, for everything from a public health perspective and from a public safety perspective. But just as in other things in life, it's never simple. And, and offenders with mental illness, by giving them the master statuses just as someone who's mentally ill, it's never that simple. Yes, they have a mental illness. Yes, that mental illness needs to be addressed and treated. But just by treating that mental illness, reducing symptoms, doesn't mean we're gonna get the public safety outcome that we probably want. That would be decreasing the likelihood that that person's gonna recidivate. Um, those are challenging ideas. We can't necessarily treat our way by itself from, or treat our way out of recidivism just by addressing the symptoms of the effect. Uh, there's a, a, a great opportunity here, and there's, a, a, and I'll, I'll promote it a little bit. There's the Council of State Governments Consensus Project. Uh, if you do a quick Google search, you'll find a tremendous amount of resources on really what works in terms of uh, improving outcomes for people who are mentally ill in the criminal justice system. We're really lucky to live here in Southeast Idaho, very close. So just in Bonneville County, there's a national learning site. Um, it's the Bonneville County Mental Health Court that is part of the consensus project that has really been on the cutting edge on what to do to help uh, people with mental illness be successful in the community. Um, because really when we think about our options, when we think about uh, the incarceration or imprisonment of someone with mental illness, um, People who go to prison don't come back to us better than when they, they don't come back to us better. Uh, and, and also we have to realize that people who go to prison, uh, the vast majority, 97% of them, are coming back to us. Um, people with mental illness, more than people without that diagnosis, suffer even more than people uh, 
than, than regular prisons who go or regular inmates who go to prison. Uh, we, we've, hear, we've heard many stories about people who, because of switching over to formulary medication or because they're separated from some of the interventions that we're working in the community, you know, rapidly decompensate, become disciplinary problems in prison, and it is a downward spiral from there. And so as much as we can, knowing that you know, our legislature set a policy that imprisonment and punishment is, is really uh, at the discretion of the judge, and the judge in crafting a sentence has to consider general deterrence. Does the punishment fit the severity of the crime? You know, the likelihood of rehabilitation of this offender, you know, dangerousness to the community, all these factors in determining what's a just sentence for the offender. All this has to come together, but uh, we, we also know that there are some things that we can do, particularly if that person's kept in the community, um, that will enhance the ability of that person to, to, to really, for lack of a better term, get better. And, and getting better, not just in terms of symptoms going down, but in terms of less likely to commit a crime. Um, I'd refer all of you, if you're interested, besides that consensus project, to look up the, the research of Dr. Jennifer Skeen. Uh, Dr. Skeen um, is a uh, PhD from the University of Utah, um, was a, a lecturer or a professor at University of California, Irvine. Um, she's done in collaboration with a number of other PhDs some, some really challenging work uh, about how we think of mental illness and how we think of mental illness in the criminal justice system. Um, so that, that's kind of a that's kind of a kickoff, and we have a question. I was going to say, could you just spell her name? Yeah, it's a S K E E M. Okay. Last Thank name you. Scheme. Jennifer. Jennifer Scheme. Thank you. Um, if I understand this will be on this presentation will be on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, just search for Jennifer Scheme C S G for Council of State Governments, and they have they have some of her lectures that are on there. There's one in particular that I think is is very good, and I always recommend. It's uh, a 2011 presentation she did for the Council of State Governments. It's you'll you'll see it on the list when you when you search for her on YouTube. Um, so, so that's that's exciting, and, and I, I hope you you find that hopeful that there there is a there is a way to do things better, and it's something that doesn't require tremendous investment. Um, the vast majority of people under correctional supervision aren't in our prisons; they're in our communities under probation and parole. And if we have good probation officers, good parole officers who are using research-based practices for working with offenders with mental illness. There's a real opportunity by using that fair, firm, uh, uh, problem-solving relationship with maybe a little higher tolerance for uh, technical compliance, and then also uh, recognizing that an over-reliance on threats of jail or threats of revocation don't land well with people with mental illness. We can really dramatically improve the likelihood that that person's gonna be successful on probation and reduce the likelihood that that person's going to reoffend. Um, and at the same time, we have to be connecting them with mental health services. Because if they're actively symptomatic, if they are decompensated and off their medication, then they're not in the state to receive that information and form those relationships and, and, and really take advantage of a probation officer who's there to see them succeed rather than a probation officer who's there to catch them um, breaking the rules. So with that, I want to shift over. We can, well, first we can either have a conversation about mental health and, and criminal justice right now, or I can shift over and talk a little bit about pretrial justice reform, and then take questions all together. Keep going, oh, uh, Susan. Can I ask a question really quick about the um, behavioral health aspect of it? Um, you know, what effect do you think the Behavioral Health Center would have on our system here in Pocatello if one were to be constructed? Sure, so the, the question is, um, if we had a Behavioral Health Center or a Crisis Center, I think is what we're, what we're referring to, yeah. if we had one of those in Pocatello, what would be the potential impact in terms of the number of people who are mentally ill who would end up in jail? Right. Um, I, you know, I, I think it would be a, a tremendous benefit to our community, and we would see real numbers in terms of reducing the people who end up on the front end in particular, 
um, uh, uh, not going to jail. And the way that, that I, I think ultimately this would work is, is right now, law enforcement, bless their hearts, have limited options when someone is actively symptomatic in the community and is in need of emergency care. They can go to the emergency room or they can go to jail. And uh, often if someone uh, ends up in, in, in jail, um, they're, you know, just like we were talking about earlier, they, you know, Sheriff Nelson and his staff are doing everything they can. We have, uh, we have their, their services out there. There's a formulary to try and help that person with medication. But, but generally being incarcerated for any amount of time leads to someone um, not getting better, but, but actively becoming worse. And so if we had, uh, we had if, we, if law enforcement had an opportunity that when they're responding to that call, that crisis call, that if there was a place where someone could be stabilized, where someone could get immediate access uh, either, to, uh, uh, either to a nurse, uh, either to a nurse practitioner, or even someone who is a prescriber, uh, there would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, if we think about this as kind of a, a different points and, and different intersections or intercept model, that is another opportunity to intercept that person who's in crisis instead of having to intercept them at jail. So it's not a panacea. You know, it won't suddenly end the incarceration of mentally ill people in, in Bannock County or in our judicial district, but it's an important option to have because without it, um, we, 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 we simply have uh, a, a finite number of places. And um, unfortunately, often, one of the places or one of the big places where people are ending up is, is, is in jail or in uh, handcuffs in the, back of the, in the back of a police car. Um, we also think that having a crisis center here in, in Bannock County that serves our, our sixth judicial district or, or our regional uh, health and welfare area, it creates a natural synergy. So besides that kind of intercept between when law enforcement's called to respond to a crisis, it also gives an opportunity to, to, to build some important connections. We know that the crisis center is a model that, uh, you know, by, by code, by ADAPA regulation, only serves someone for 23 hours and 59 minutes, and that person has to be discharged. What our vision is, and I think the vision that was, was really talked a lot about when the bond was going around, was that the crisis center, along with some other efforts to build bridges, what we call a transition center, would create a, a crisis intervention, and then some opportunities, whether it's case management, short-term temporary housing, some uh, county-based uh, treatment opportunities, and then really some, uh, whether we call it uh, system navigation or case management, some opportunities to connect that person to, to needed resources would be that bridge between the crisis care and addressing the immediacy of need, um, you know, taking care of what's acute, and then start getting us moving towards, well, how do we take care of the chronic underlying long-term needs of that person? Because if we look at some of the other statistics from crisis centers throughout the state, an, an important number to look at is number of, no, they'll have total number of clients served and then they'll have total number of unique clients served. And what you'll see is, um, you'll see a big chunk of people who are not unique clients. So you'll have that someone who gets discharged after 23 hours and 59 minutes. They step out and have a cigarette, and they come back in and they get readmitted for another 24-hour cycle. And that, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because that person's in need and they're trying to get help. But the crisis centers are limited in terms of, of what they can do because of the model, because of the rules around it, and the, and the conditions around the funding. So for, I think, our community to realize the biggest gain from a crisis center is, yes, we need a crisis center. Yes, it is going to be an opportunity to intercept and divert some people, mentally ill people, from going to jail. But we also need to know what happens on that 24th hour and what services and what connections can we make to make sure that person who was in crisis and is now um, towards the path of stabilization doesn't go back into crisis. And, and that's one of the gaps. And whether that's a transition center, whether that's um, more opportunities for uh, you know, privately or uh, privately provided through a nonprofit or for a for-profit of more access to care and more, better access to care for that person. Um, you know, I, I don't have the answer for that 100%, but we need to think crisis center first step, what happens after stabilization, and how do we maintain that person 
in our community to make sure that their symptoms are managed so they don't end up in the emergency room and they don't end up in jail. So a lot of response to a, a question. Yes? Can you address how substance abuse and related charges fit in with what you're talking about? Sure, so the question was, um, in terms of uh, people with mental illness who are in the criminal justice system, what's the interrelation between criminal charges and substance abuse? So uh, the, I, I'll, I'll give you a big, a, a kind of a big number here. So when we think of people who are mentally ill in the criminal justice system, about 70% of them have a co-occurring substance use disorder. Um, a huge number. You know, uh, so when basically so big that when we're kind of planning programming around it, we just assume that if you're mentally ill in the criminal justice system, you also have a co-occurring substance use disorder. Substance uh, use disorder complicates things because substance use disorder is a criminogenic factor. If you're a, someone who has an addiction, um, that's something that uh, either through the seeking of your drug of choice or through committing criminal acts to get money or uh, or, uh, to, you know, robberies, thefts, shoplifting, whatever it might be, um, or hanging around people who are, in the, you know, who are criminally oriented. These are all things that pull that person uh, uh, into decisions, choices, um, uh, uh, circumstances that contribute to the likelihood that that person is going to recidivate. So when we, when we think of a model of how to work with someone who has a substance use disorder and a mental health, dis health disorder, the, the, the first rule that I, that I always taught is whatever door they come into, we welcome them through that door. Um, in Idaho, and I think we've made progress in this, but I think one of the hallmarks of Idaho, and Idaho's not the only state in this, is we've had a siloed system between mental health and substance use. And if you come in one door and you don't fit in that door, you get kicked out. If we wanted to have a, a system that was really meant to deliver maximum effect to someone who has a co-occurring co disorder, we wouldn't care which door they came in. And so if I went up to the adult mental health, uh, the, the human development center, and I came in and I had a, uh, a meth-induced schizophrenia, they wouldn't say we can't treat you because we think your primary problem is your, your meth-induced schizophrenia, so we can't, we can't serve you. And, and, and Ross Edmonds, who's one of the division directors from Health and Welfare, made my heart uh, so happy when I heard him recently, there's a meeting last year, in addressing his program manager say, if they have a diagnosis, it doesn't matter how they got to diagnosis, treat them. Um, and, and that's that idea that we're welcome to that person. You still have to meet clinical criteria, but if, it's, if, it's, uh, if you have a substance use disorder, it doesn't matter that that substance use disorder exists along with your schizophrenia. It's treat the person and, and treat those things together. Because unless we address both of those aspects, I mean, um, knowing that there's a mental health issue that needs to address um, so we can get them um, stabilized and get them successful in treatment for their substance use disorder, unless we tackle both of those things, we're not taking a holistic approach to the person and we're less likely to be, effect or be effective both from a humanistic perspective of getting that person better and then also from a perspective of public investment that we're putting, I think what's happening is when I get close to that microphone, it's picking me up on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so we need to address both. A representative vote. Yeah, in light of that, uh, what do you think the effect of Attorney General Sessions uh, direction to pro all prosecutors to have the most severe punishment possible for all drug crimes? So again, talking from, from, from Kerry's perspective, yeah. right? Um, punishment, if punishment worked, then we wouldn't have recidivists, right? Because if everyone who went to prison got better, then, then we wouldn't really, I would not have a job right now if, putting, if punishing people did away with crime. It's it, it simply, it, it, there, there's, there's simply not a connection there. I, I have to always say this because when we look at, again, you know, the policy that's been established by the legislature, punishment is a legitimate objective of the criminal justice system. When the judge is sentencing a defendant and is considering the interests of justice, um, punishment, whether there's a rehabilitative goal or a deterrent goal tied to that, 
is a legitimate reason for a judge to say, Carrie, you're going to take a time out and spend a year in jail. But thinking that by punishing someone who has an addiction and, and, and putting them in, in, in prison for whatever period of time is going to make them better, uh, it's not supported by the research. I, I will say this, that if we lived in, in a, a system where we were willing to commit unlimited resources to realizing the benefit of a warehousing effect. When I say a warehousing effect is, is if someone who's a, uh, if, if someone's an offender, however they come into the system, they're incapacitated because they're in prison. So they're not committing crimes in the community while they're in prison. And you can measure that effect. You know, uh, ultimately, as someone gets older, they age out and they become less likely to, to reoffend. But the, the, the damage that prison does uh, really offsets long-term any short-term benefit you gain from warehousing people in an institution to try and get a reduction in recidivism by incapacitating that person by keeping them out of the community. So uh, I understand from a, from a policy perspective why punishment is part of the conversation. But if we look at a goal of reducing recidivism and rehabilitating people, uh, putting someone in, in prison for uh, the maximum amount of time we can give them isn't, because they aren't going to come back in our community, isn't making us safer and isn't increasing uh, that person's uh, likelihood for successful reintegration and successful life as a member, productive member in our community. So I'm trying to do my best to answer without getting too political, but I, I, I think some of you know me probably know where my heart is. Well, and what I've seen with the parents of some of the kids I've worked with that um, have been to prison for felony drug use or selling, like methamphetamine. I mean, one woman told me, um, and, and she looked like you or I and was well-spoken, a very nice person. And she said she really would like to get a job where she can save her retirement and earn enough money to care for her children. But people with felony records can't get those kind of jobs. That the good employers that provide 401ks and insurance they don't hire people like that. So even if, when they want to turn their lives around, it's really hard. You know, so uh, to, to kind of uh, uh, pass along the, the comment, you know, what, what Susan was talking about is the impact of the collateral effects of a criminal conviction or the collateral effects of going to prison and, and how that really stacks the deck about someone who in, you know, they may be ready and may be wanting to make some changes, um, but instead of, uh, uh, it, instead of having a clear path to community reintegration, it becomes increasingly more and more difficult, whether through employment or housing, um, you know, the, the, the stigma around that offense. And you know, we, can, you know, we, we, we can think about uh, a whole separate conversation about thinking about the collateral consequences of a criminal conviction and it's even more frightening when we talk about the collateral consequences of a juvenile conviction. Um, we could spend a whole other hour, hour and a half talking about that. And um, one, one of the things to think about today, too, is, uh, you know, there, there's a term that one of my old bosses used when we had this conversation. And she called it, there was practical obscurity pre-internet, right? That if, if there was a file that was on a shelf in some courtroom, if someone wanted to look at that file, even though it was a public record, they had to get out of their pajamas, get in their car, drive to the courthouse, know the defendant's name or the case number, have a clerk pull that off, and sit there and read the file. Now you can, you can not only leave your bed, um, stay in your pajamas and Google on your phone and find out um, Do a name search. pretty much anything about anybody. And, and, and that has real consequences for, for folks. Um, you know, uh, if right now on the Idaho Data Repository, um, if you look up a juvenile case, if you try and search someone's name and they have a juvenile case, you'll see uh, a little, you get a little blurb that says, uh, 
filed sealed by, by court order, okay? And, and so we do our best to protect it, but what do people think when you search for a name and you get on the data repository, file sealed by court order? They think immediately, oh, this person's the worst sex offender that ever lived. You know, even though that may have nothing to do with it. They may, they may have their, the reason why their name is filed and sealed, not because they're an offender, is because they were a party to the case and that case is exempt from public disclosure. Um, so when we get our new case management system and the new data repository, that, that will be addressed. But there are a lot of collateral consequences to being involved in criminal justice system. Yes? Speaking of juveniles, uh, I keep reading of cases where say, the juvenile has committed a really horrible, horrible crime. And so they moved it to adult court. Uh, are there any countries where no matter how awful the crime is, a juvenile still goes to juvenile court? You know, I'm sure there are. Uh, usually we're, we're lagging in terms of how progressive our criminal justice system is in, in, in the United States. I couldn't, I couldn't name countries. I know recently, um, and this isn't a juvenile example, it's an adult example, there was a, a group of, of Idaho leaders, uh, I think it was representatives both from House Judiciary and Rules and Senate Judiciary Rules, along with representatives from the Department of Correction and then Chief Justice Burdick, they went to visit a a prison in, in Norway to look at alternative models of, of how to treat people. Um, I, I, I can certainly take a look. I, I bet we find some examples of different ways of thinking. Maybe I should just say, what is your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> so my opinion <laughs> is... Do you being moved to adult court because of the nature of the crime? My, my opinion is... is okay, so repeat the question. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you, Pam, for reminding me. So the question is, is what is what is my personal opinion on moving a juvenile to the adult system based upon the seriousness of the, of the offense that they've been charged with? So I, I'll, I'll share this. Um, I think we know uh, more and more, be, you know, if we look at the, the science or the brain development, um, why we need to treat juveniles differently than, than how we treat adults. Um, for, for a long time, we've thought about this in context of, of the frontal lobe development of juveniles and recognizing that the, the brain kind of develops back to front and our frontal lobe really controls some of the executive decision making, impulse control, um, kind of tamping down thrill seeking behavior and that because that doesn't really get done until someone's 25, 26 or 27, physiologically there are reasons why kids do kid stuff because their brain's not fully baked. And you guys all knew this without me telling you what the science is about brain development. And so when we know that there's people who, for physiological reasons, aren't capable of making the same decisions that, say, an adult would make in those same positions, it's a much harder proposition to hold them accountable, like an adult, for, for doing those things. That, that's not letting some of the horrific acts that, that, kids, that people who are under the age of 18 have committed um, but I, I do think there's, there's definite need to look at uh, legitimate reasons why we have the Juvenile Corrections Act and why we need to think, uh, we need to understand and recognize that what's good for an adult committing the same thing isn't necessarily what justice is for a juvenile who commits the same thing. There, there's a line of Supreme Court cases out there right now also looking at life imprisonment for, for juveniles and about um, what that really means for someone who's 14 or 15 who, uh, for, for acts they've committed, regardless of how heinous about um, them staying in an institution uh, for, for the rest of their days. And, and um, I, I wish I could give you the sites off the top of my head, but if you, if you just take a quick look, you'll, you'll find some examples. And then just as kind of a teaser too, because research is always changing, and I'm kind of a junkie for these things, um, I should give you guys a podcast list of things to listen to because I, I get a lot, I get excited about some of those. There's, there's some very small studies that are coming out that are even challenging our notions about the brain development theory. That, that some of the reasons why juveniles do what juveniles do partly is because of brain development, but also it's more experiential. That often juveniles know exactly what they're doing and they know exactly what the consequences might be, but because they lack context and because um, they're naturally looking for the experience or the sensation of doing the, those things. They do it anyway. And one of the kind of little examples that, that I've heard is 
if you guys are plugged in, I mean, there's, there's, I'm sure there's either you have kids or you know a kid who watches YouTube. There's this cinnamon challenge where you try, the, the kid will YouTube himself trying to eat a whole tablespoon of cinnamon and then just spit it out, you know, because they, they, they can't do it. They start coughing and it's a horrible thing. Um, but everyone does it, you know, and they're, they're, they know exactly what's going to happen, but they do it anyway. You know, so everything is there uh, 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 in terms of understanding consequences and knowing exactly what's going to happen, but they do it anyway because kids are, are really striving to get that experiential aspect of life, and they don't get it until they do it. Um, so anyway, uh, there was... Uh, uh, there was an author on uh, Terry Gross Fresh Air talking about some of the research on, on juvenile uh, juvenile offenders, and they, they, they related that study. So, yeah, yes. I can ask just a follow-up question on that. Um, what about when the juvenile does has committed a horrible crime, but they have not taken responsibility for committing that crime? Um, does that affect? I mean, I, I have been, I understand what you're saying about children being sentenced to life. You know, they're different, so maybe the sentences and the treatment, I mean, where they get sentenced to should be different. But sometimes I, um, there's cases where they've committed a really horrible crime where they've never owned that and taken responsibility for it. And I'm wondering how that would play into the sentence. Yeah, so the question is, is if you have a juvenile or, or maybe even any, uh, any offender who, right. when, when they've committed something horrible and they, they, they don't show any contrition, they don't take accountability for the things they've done, what, if, if any weight, should a judge give in determining a sentence if the objective is, is justice? And, and, and that's where, and, and thank goodness that I don't have to wear those robes and I don't have to make those decisions, where, where the judge is going to look at that. And, and, and right now, as part of our sentencing statute, the judge can consider um, that, that, that that person needs punishment that reflects the seriousness of what that person has done. And if someone, um, you know, if, if someone is remorseful, it, it's up to the judge to decide, does that mitigate the amount of punishment that this person deserves? whether because it's going to deter that person or because that person is less likely to reoffend because they've accepted responsibility. Uh, I can't say or I can't cite you a, a study or research that says if someone stands before the judge and says, judge, I own this. I know what I did. What I did was, was horrible. Um, uh, uh, you know, throw the book at me. I, I, I'm at your mercy. I don't know if we have, at least I've never seen anything that says that person is, you know, because of the sentence that they were given, um, is going to have a better outcome than someone who, you know, up to the moment they were put in cuffs and put on the bus to go to the penitentiary, whether they have any different outcome. Because I'm just wondering specifically between adult sentencing and <clears throat> juvenile sentencing, sometimes with an adult when they've committed a horrible crime and, and they don't admit it or show any remorse, then they're going to get the longer sentence, or often life is used because you say, well, this person never, you know, showed any remorse or or took any responsibility for the crime. So you give them, you know, you throw the book at them, so to speak. But that's where I wonder if, if juveniles are going to sort of automatically have a chance, that, you know, not get life. Then what do you do with them when they really won't even take any responsibility? So That's a great question. I, I wish I had an answer for you. I, I, I will share this with you, that the judges that I've worked with, um, I, I don't know if, if any one of them would say that they sentence someone based on any just one thing. Yeah. yeah. That, it, that it's usually, they, you know, they've had a chance to look at everything that's presented, been presented to the case. They had a pre-sentence investigation done. There may have been evaluations, both psychological or you know, behavioral health. And the judge, in looking at everything that's that, that's in front of them, they try and craft a sentence that, that meets the needs of their community, that meets the needs of the law, meets the needs of justice. And it's not often they can put, okay, this this person is not remorseful, and because of that single factor, you're going to do seven years indeterminate versus five years indeterminate or determinate, whatever that might be. Pat, I just kind of want to move us on to a couple of other topics. 
Sure. Um, you, I've seen a lot of um, information about what's happening in the legislature for uh, this session of reforms and criminal justice. Could you address that? Uh, yes, and I'll, I'll jump. I'll use this as a segue to talk about another thing I'm excited okay. about. And, and so that's pretrial justice. And I do that think that, the other that, yeah. that we will see something on the ballot, potentially a concurrent resolution to amend Idaho's constitution around preventive detention. So when we talk about pretrial services or pretrial justice, what I'm really referencing is, is what happens on the very front end of when someone is arrested and coming into the criminal justice system. Uh, so in, in America, we have this uh, idea of presumption of innocence until proven guilty. And so when someone's arrested uh, in Idaho based on our constitution, they have a right to bail. And what bail is, is that you're make, basically making a promise that if, if I put up either uh, a, a commitment or a contract that I'm going to behave in a certain way, or I put up property or money or a, a surety, an insurance policy that I bought from a bail bondsman, that based upon my ability to do that, that until uh, that I'll be able to get out of jail, be in the community, and I promise that I won't commit any more crimes and that I'll attend all my court hearings. Uh, so that's the, really the state of the state in, in Idaho right now. But we have some really interesting things going on, both at the federal level and then in other states, where that act of tying release to ability to pay or, to, or, or to, to buy that insurance policy from Bell Bondsman is going away. Um, and this is a really exciting prospect because what the research tells us about um, uh, how safe we are as a community being protected because someone has, has, has posted or made bail, posted a bond, um, versus having a system where someone's released with conditions of supervision but money is totally taken out of the equation, Having a money system and, or having a non-financial based system, it doesn't matter either way in terms of outcomes for that effect, right? So uh, 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 when, when I say failure rate, I'm gonna talk about failure rates real quick. What a failure rate is, we really are, we are really interested in two things on pretrial justice. That the person's gonna come back for the court hearings and then they're not gonna commit crimes while they're on release. The failure rate in places that use financial considerations to be to bond out of jail versus states where they use non-financial risk-based, so released with conditions, there's no difference in failure rates. You're just as likely to come back for your court hearings with conditions as if you had money on the case. You're just as not likely to commit new crimes when you're on release if you have money on the case versus if you're being supervised by pretrial services. So, so why are we doing what we're doing? Um, we might see the only difference between two people who've committed the same crime, exact same crime. The difference between that one, one person staying in jail and another person getting out of jail isn't the risk to the community, isn't the likelihood that they're gonna go back to court. It's how much money's in their bank account. And if we think about justice and what we want as citizens of Idaho, or citizens of the United States, um, we have to think, does that line up with what we as a, as a state, we as citizens, is that how we want to have things work? Um, there's, there's something that uh, Idaho has been looking at, and so in Idaho, we have a Criminal Justice Commission, and Representative Bo for, for a number of years served on the Criminal Justice Commission. Um, when I was in Boise, I had the opportunity to, to sit in those meetings and to participate on some of the subcommittees. For a couple of years now, they've had a subcommittee to look at pretrial justice in Idaho. And they've come up with a series of recommendations. And I'll leave a copy with Pam, if I could. I brought one with me today uh, about changes that that pretrial justice subcommittee of the Criminal Justice Commission is recommending to try and change things in Idaho. One of the most important things is to have a validated risk assessment that the court can consider um, when determining bail or release on own recognizance, OR release, that gives us a sense of not on that person's ability to pay whether, they're, whether they should be released, but on the risk factors that person poses on their likelihood to come back to their court hearing and their likelihood to commit an offense while they're released in the community. Um, the the pretrial subcommittee has recommended that the state of Idaho adopt a statewide tool. Um, one of the most exciting ones is called the uh, 
uh, the PSA, and it's called, uh, PSA is an acronym for Public Safety Assessment. It was developed by the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. It's a public domain tool, so it doesn't cost the state of Idaho anything. It looks at nine factors. It's been validated, predictive, looking at over a million cases uh, nationally. And what it does is it gives the judge information uh, that the judge can consider, along with other factors, uh, to help determine whether this person um, you know, should be released with conditions or, and this goes to that constitutional amendment, um, the, pre-trial, uh, the pretrial justice subcommittee working the Criminal Justice Commission has come up with some language for a proposed constitutional amendment around preventative detention. The concept of preventative detention is important in the pretrial service or the pretrial justice reform conversation because there are some defendants out there who simply, if we look at their risk and their likelihood to commit offenses in the community or the likelihood that they're going to um, not come to their court hearings, that they're so risky it would be inappropriate to place them in the community, or excuse me, in the community. And so what the preventative detention constitutional amendment would be is it's gonna change the right to bail in Idaho for a certain small subset of cases where the court uh, determines that that person is, is simply too much of a threat to be in the community while they're awaiting trial. Uh, so what this does is um, creates kind of a safety net on the back end uh, to, to look at those, you know, those very specific cases um, and, and address the kind of the overwhelming need for public safety to say, we're not presuming that this person is guilty of the crime, but the risk is so high based upon the risk factors that are present in this case that this, this person should stay incarcerated until there's a disposition on their case. Um, so I'll leave that document with those recommendations with Pam, and, and she can share those with you, and I, and I hope you think about it. So it would be a, a risk assessment, it would be encouraging, um, you know, look, encouraging Idaho to look at our use of bail bond guidelines, which is what it is, it's a, uh, by court rule, there are certain dollar amounts that are tied to certain offenses that set a standardized bail amount, um, moving beyond looking at offenses and dollar amounts, looking more to the results of things like risk assessments that allow a judge to determine whether someone should be held pre-trial based upon um, not their ability to pay, but the, the risk that they really post to the community. And then also looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, some ideas around can we, can we work with law enforcement to come up with some, some better approaches to what we do when someone is, is committing a crime? We had a, a great presentation from uh, Chief Bones, uh, Boise Police Department, who talked about citations and move arrest. Um, law enforcement has a lot of discretion about when they respond to uh, a report of a crime. And if, if in looking at that sp- specific circumstance, the law enforcement um, decides that it's, it's not a, a public safety issue that requires this person to be taken into custody, arrested, booked in jail, and kept in jail until they can come in and be arraigned or, or make bond, that uh, we, we look at, for all law enforcement, some training and some clear direction from their leadership about when to exercise that discretion and when it's appropriate to cite someone and release them instead of um, arresting that person and then taking them to, to jail. So there, there was a question. Yeah, are, are there any states right now that are using this model as far as uh, standby factors, risk factors, and bond rates? Right? Yeah, uh, uh, the, the question was, is are there other jurisdictions that are using this uh, PSA assessment? Um, I think there are 38 jurisdictions um, nationally. A couple of those include entire states. Um, I want to say New Jersey, Kentucky, um, Actually, instead of me kind of going off my vague memory, if you just look up Laura and John Arnold Foundation, and then they, they have a whole section on some of their research around the PSA. There's a list of all the jurisdictions that have adopted um, the PSA. And uh, I'll offer this too, because you know I was just talking about law enforcement exercising some discretion and using citation and move arrest. These tools, whether the the assessments I was talking about earlier that measure criminogenic risk or the PSA that's measuring those nine factors that are related to failure rate while on pretrial, these are tools meant to support the exercise of discretion. 
They're not tools meant to make these decisions that judges have, or law enforcement have, to be a mechanical, formulaic process. So, um, you know, we were talking earlier about, I, I don't know if, I've, I've, if I have any judge who will tell me that, yeah, I made this sentence based upon this one single sole factor. There's a lot of things that go in this decision. If you look at uh, Idaho Criminal Rule 46, you'll see the factors that judges consider in, in, in uh, pretrial, uh, things that they'll look at in considering kind of what's just. Um, what we would do is we'd, we'd also amend court rule, uh, criminal court rule 46 to include, among those other, I think there's 10, uh, 10, 11 factors, to include that the court you know, may consider and give weight to the results of a um, statewide pretrial risk assessment and use that along with everything else uh, to say, okay, here's the best way that I can um, both protect the community and make sure this person's coming back, but also understand that um, by putting someone uh, in jail pre-trial, there are collateral consequences of that, both for the defendant and for the community. So, and I keep saying, if we went to Sheriff Nelson, if we went to Sheriff Nelson and asked him to show us what the jail population looks like, if his jail is like what, what nationally the pretrial population looks like, 50 to 60% of the people in the Bannock County Jail are in there awaiting trial. So they haven't been, they don't have a, uh, they don't have a disposition. They've not been found and they've been sentenced and are sitting out uh, a sentence in the jail. It's they're there waiting for that to happen, okay? And so we know that if we had a better system of using that really expensive resource wisely, um, we could make a, a pretty significant impact of the amount of people who are incarcerated right now. Um, on the defendant side, remember these are folks that haven't been found guilty. They've been arrested. They haven't been found guilty yet. We know that if you're a low risk person based upon the assessment, the PSA, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's something called a three day rule. If you're incarcerated more than three days and you're low risk, instead of decreasing the likelihood that you're going to commit new crimes, we start increasing. So as little as three days, um, because what, when we look at why, you know, the, those criminogenic factors, we start after three days interfering with things like housing and employment and pro-social connections. And what do we replace them with? We replace them with everybody else who's in jail. Okay? And, and these can be populations who are, are pretty vulnerable. Uh, and I'm not trying to offer an excuse for accountability for decisions they've made and, and acts that they've done that have gotten themselves in jail. But three days is, is kind of the window we have before we start seeing these negative consequences. Also, we know that in terms of someone, someone's ability to participate in their own defense, if someone who is held in custody for the entire uh, time up to pretrial, they have dramatically different outcomes in the likelihood of what the disposition is going to be. So if you're able to participate in your own defense um, without having to schedule uh, contacts to your attorney by coming out to jail or over the phone, um, there are some measurable impacts on, on how, uh, uh, how likely you will be convicted or not be convicted if you're on release versus whether you're in jail. Yes? Um, so I don't know how recent this is, but ACLU and Southern Poverty Law Center have published a lot in the last couple of years about um, how inequitable the bail systems are. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center in the South, but ACLU throughout the country, the poor people that can't afford bail end up going into debt to bail bonds company or they stay in jail and they lose their jobs. Um, and then they also make plea bargains <laughs> that they maybe wouldn't yes. have made otherwise. So do you think the PSA system that, that you've described that's being considered, do you think it will help reduce some of that inequality that we won't just have poor people sitting in jail? Uh, so, so the question was, is if we develop maybe a more evidence-based pretrial justice system, would that uh, decrease the impact of poverty in terms of accepting plea deals? Because if I take the plea deal, even though I may or may not be innocent, if I take that deal, I'll get out of jail, versus if I don't take that deal, I will stay in jail. That, that's, that's really the whole idea. 
Um, you know, it's not going to be all of a sudden we see no more impact of, of poverty in the justice system, but I think it's an important step in the area of pretrial justice to look at what can we do to take money out of the system. And, and, and what that means is looking at, for, for the majority of these cases, giving the judge some validated, good information to consider to set conditions that are reasonably related to uh, uh, keeping people safe and ensuring that they're gonna come back for their hearing and, and placing good risks back into the community. Um, there was a really interesting article in the New York Times. It was an op-ed, I think it was written by a, a public defender out of New York talking about kind of the cycle of, and, and kind of the, um, the craziness of that if you plead guilty to an offense, we'll get you out. But if you maintain your innocence, yeah. you're gonna sit. How counterintuitive is that? Yes, Representative. You mentioned um, you know, your research on this and the idea of having uh, pre-trial pre uh, changes. And, and you also mentioned that as a constitutional amendment. So where does that stand as far as uh, our being able to vote on something like that or legislation on that? Uh, what's the so, situation right now? So the, the question was, is uh, I mentioned a potential uh, joint resolution to put to the voters of Idaho a constitutional amendment to allow for preventive detention in Idaho. So the, the answer to that is, is the Criminal Justice Commission, which our uh, governor appointees have adopted language and have recommended to the governor um, uh, uh, what that constitutional amendment would look like. The, the next step is, and I haven't heard this part yet, is who's going to be our legislative champion to get that uh, resolution going there in this it's session. There anymore, it's <laughs> uh, and we've had a lot of change. I, I think we, in that, in that committee, um, I think we have uh, uh, Senator Patty Ann Lodge, um, who, who was part of that. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if Representative Luker, as chair of the House June Rules, I, I don't know that he's there. I, I believe uh, Senator Burgoyne is still on Criminal Justice Commission. Mm -hmm. So we need, we still need, I think the executive branch through the recommendation of Criminal Justice Commission has that language, but I don't know who the legislative champion is going to be. Because we, before it gets to the ballot, of course you have to get those joint resolutions through the legislature before I know voters can, can, can vote on the Constitution. Um, I, I can certainly uh, send that up the ladder and see if if, uh, if if we found that legislative champion yet. And so, will all of us know when it comes before the legislature? Uh, I, it's something that I'm very interested in, and, and, and as soon as I hear anything, I'll check with Pam to see if she's heard and we can get something out. Question? Um, Back to the pre-sentence uh, assessment, uh, I think you listed nine different factors. Is one of the factors, we've talked about the offenders, but what about the victims? Is one of the factors taken into consideration as far as the victims of these individual crimes? The offense is, has already occurred, and they're looking for deferment, bail, whatever. Is one of those risk factors, uh, the victim, uh, have them all under consideration? You know, victim, uh, victim rights, it, it, that's another huge topic that's going to be in front of the legislature. Some of you guys might have heard about Marcy's Law and that, and that proposal. Um, I'm not trying to discount the impact on the victim, but we also have to remember that pretrial is post-disposition. So this is someone who's been accused of the crime but hasn't been found guilty. And so uh, you know, certainly the victim should be informed if that person uh, who's been accused is being released. But since that person hasn't been convicted, um, we can't assume that they are culpable for everything quite yet. And so I, I can share with you what those nine factors that are considered on the PSA. And this is something you can get right off the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. That is a, it's a one-pager on what the PSA looks like. And I can even leave this with, with Pam if she wanted to share it. So the PSA score calculated nine factors. So the, the question is, is whether the current uh, offense was a violent offense, um, what the pending charge at the time of the offense was, if they've had a prior misdemeanor conviction, a prior felony conviction, a prior violent conviction, prior failure to appear pre-trial in past two years, prior failure to appear pre-trial uh, pre older than two years, 
prior sentence to incarceration and age at first arrest. Um, so one of the things that they've done really tried hard with the PSA is to try and keep out certain bias factors. And so they, it, it doesn't look at um, race, gender, income, education, home address, drug use history, family status, marital status, national origin, employment, and, re and religion. And, and this is uh, not only to make it a, you know, out of, out of fairness, but also because those factors aren't related to the, to the two goals of pretrial, which are um, your likelihood to come back to your hearing and your likelihood to commit a new offense while you're on release. Um, so I can, I can leave that here today. Other questions? Yes, Miro. Um, to follow on what Susan was talking about, the um, people in jail because they can't get their bail, and they're horrible stories out of Ferguson and elsewhere where the city is making money on this thing. What is the status here in Manic County? Are we, um, yeah, what proportion of the people are, in, are staying in jail because they don't, they can't afford bail? And are we making money on them? Yeah. Um, so the, the question was, is that we've, we've heard different horror stories about what's happening nationally, about people who are held pretrial, um, whether there's, uh, whether the jurisdiction is making money off of holding people, and, and what are we doing here in Bandit County or in 6th District uh, around those areas. We, we don't have all of these reforms that are being proposed in place here in Bannock County. We do have a pretrial service unit within our court services division um, here in Bannock County. They go and interview everyone who's incarcerated. They don't do the PSA, but they use what's called a modified Vera scale. The Vera Institute is an institute that's been around forever, basically. Um, that's been really pushing reforms and it was really on the early edge of, of looking at pretrial. So they look at things, a number of factors about connection to community, employment, stable housing, um, whether his, looking historically, whether they've failed to appear or failed to pay and looking at their convictions. And they do present the arraignment judge um, with a sheet that, that captures all this. They don't give a recommendation, they don't give an overall score. But they give the judge some background of this person that the judge can look at and consider on setting OR conditions um, or uh, you know, setting what is, a, you know, what is the right amount of bail. I also know, because I, I've seen it and I've been part of this process, is that the judges will get the jail list periodically and do what's called a scrub. And this was really going on probably more diligently uh, when we were when they were remodeling the uh, one of the jail pods than, than maybe what we're doing right now, but they would look for people who haven't been released to jail who have very low bond, and and uh, and, and looking at those cases and determining whether is this that case that but for two hundred dollars they would be released, right? And so I know our judges are very aware of and and, and really I think at the last four different judicial trainings that we've had. We've had someone there to talk about both to our magistrate judges and our district judges about pretrial and what opportunities that judges have to, to kind of, when we think about judges become judges because they have an interest in justice, what opportunities they have in, in kind of building a more just approach to the defendant at that pretrial, at that pretrial stage. So are we doing, are we, are we the model of evidence-based pretrial? No, but it's my goal to get us there in our jurisdiction. Yes? That was my question uh, related to that, is how does Idaho stack up with training judges to make these programs work effectively? Um, and how does Bannock County you know, measure yeah. in, a, in the state of Idaho? So the question was, is what's going on to train our judges and, and how does Bannock County sit in respect to that? Um, you know, we have, I, I can tell you there's, there's one judge in the state right now who's taken a lot of leadership around pretrial justice. It's uh, the Honorable James Cawthon, who's a magistrate in the 4th Judicial District in Ada County. But all of our judges um, have attended the trainings that have gone on, both from the Pretrial Justice Institute. We had the former director come in. We had the former Chief Justice of the New Mexico Supreme Court come in and talk to all of our judges. We had a, a judge from the DC Circuit come in and talk about what pretrial looks like in Washington, DC and what they're doing. Uh, and so the message is out. And I think we have a lot of, uh, a lot of our judges who are really excited 
about what we can do uh, with, with pretrial. Um, but to be real honest, Idaho's playing catch up. You know, we still have in court rule um, a bell schedule, right? And, and that's something that's inherent in tying financial conditions to release. And so we, we, have, we have, you know, the, the, the positive thing is, is that we have a roadmap, um, but we're, you know, we're still taking steps along that roadmap. Other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Last one. You know, it seems like earlier in the conversation, a lot of our discussion really was kind of focusing on recidivism and, and really almost the, the criminal's rights. And yet, I think you kind of mentioned at the very beginning of this is that really the system is really two parts. It's we would like to return that criminal to a viable uh, position in our community, but there's also the victim's rights. Uh, I, I think I, I'd return to the Adam check thing and say, I don't know whether we could ever imagine that person being viable for, for coming back to society. Uh, but, but also the deterrent for that common citizen, that, that there's a certain amount of punishment that comes with um, a certain act. Mm -hmm. I speed, I get a ticket. Guess what? That kind of deters me from speeding. Sure, I absolutely. don't want a ticket, I don't want my insurance to go up. Um, you know, that's a, at a micro level, but that's every day. We have to have a, a structure that kind of makes most of us think, eh, I wouldn't really engage in that because selling drugs, even though it uh, might seem like a really lucrative way to make some quick money, um, the consequences are, are, are much greater than that. Does it detour all? No. Sure. But uh, I think if those of us on the outside that are generally law-abiding citizens saw, well, gosh, that person just got away with it. That was an easy thing. Uh, I'll, yeah. no, that, I'll, that, I'll execute that, that same mentality because there is no consequence. That, 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 that's a so there's a balance. And I'd, I'd be interested to know your, let me wrap that up with, I'd be interested to know what the study, the statistics on, on how do we balance that? Because really it is a, it's a teeter-totter. The, the victim's rights, the, uh, the criminal's rights, trying to get the most out of both of those two systems. That, that, is, the, that is a perfect question, and, and that's, that's one that really digs at, at a lot of folks when we have these conversations. So, so let me repeat, um, basically to sum it up, you know, what, what value does deterrence have in this whole equation, and how do we balance out the rehabilitation of, of offenders, and then also ideas about what is just, and also kind of what are the things that hold our social fabric together to keep you know, right thinking, pro-social people, staying right thinking and, and pro-social, right? You know, and so when we look at this, when we think about who commits crimes, right? This is one of those 80-20 rules. You know, 80% uh, of the crimes are committed by 20% of the people. And the people who are recidivists are people um, who uh, uh, disproportionately clog up the calendars that our courts have. And I have to tell you, that's not you, and it's not anybody in this room who really does respond well to that deterrent effect. So there's a there's a portion of folks who uh, you know who who understand that if um, you know if if I make this decision, there are these consequences, and because of that, and because of how I was raised, and because of the support systems that I have, and and what I have to lose, hell no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do those things. But for sometimes people make a knucklehead decision that is really situational. They'll do it one time. They'll pay a fine. They might be on probation for a little while. We'll never see them again. What where deterrence doesn't work is on those people who aren't like us, who don't have the pro-social aspects in their life, who are highly tied to a criminal lifestyle, who have criminal thinking. Deterrence um, has has very little, if, if any, measurable effect on that person. So deterrence works on everybody who's in this room, but I'm not worried about anyone who came at 7 o'clock on the uh, on Tuesday or uh, yeah, yeah, on, 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 on a night to come listen to me talk. Um, so it's the previous conversation. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but that being said, if we look at what the direction that the legislature has given to judges is that when they're crafting a sense, they, they do need to think about deterrence. But I think we also have to understand that deterrence takes us so far. And deterrence is important in a general concept that we have a society that has order and has accountability, and that general deterrence works well for people who are concerned about that. But we also have a subset who are really the people who are driving the churn in our prisons, on probation, and through the courts, 
that deterrence has, has isn't, um, you know, even the highest thing that we can do, I mean, if we talk about death penalty, um, deterrence, I, I, don't, I haven't seen a study yet that, that really shows the measurable deterrence of the most serious sanction that, that we have in the criminal justice system for the most horrific acts that someone can, can, can uh, be convicted of. Um, it isn't that deterrence doesn't work, it's just that deterrence doesn't work for everybody. Deterrence works well for people who might commit a crime one time and I'll never see them again. Deterrence doesn't work well for someone who's enmeshed in a criminal lifestyle and, and really is the meat and potatoes of the criminal justice system. Sure, sure I think we need to start closing up. Okay, uh, well thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm always happy to kind of have these conversations. Um, uh, I'll leave some materials with Pam, and Pam has my email. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to follow up anything that you guys send my way. Thank you again for the opportunity.